everyone. Uh, my name is Carolyn Buchanan. In the conference packet, you'll see it says Janet Redman Smith couldn't be here today, so I'm kind of filling in on the presentation on AAC. Um, I am a speech language pathologist and an assistive technology professional. I work for the Florida Alliance for Assistive and Services and Technology here in Orlando, as well as for the University of Central Florida, um, the graduate program in speech language pathology. I don't have any other financial disclosures for today. But I want to talk to you about what core vocabulary is when we're talking about AAC, um, why we want to use it, what it is, especially what it is not. Um, we're going to talk about some different systems, how it shows up on an array of systems that you can find. So if you're looking <coughs> low tech all the way to high tech, this is something that you would be able to utilize. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about how we're going to implement it, techniques that can be used, as well as a lot of resources that are out there for core vocabulary these days. We're kind of a small group, so if you guys have any questions or anything, just shoot it for hand, I'm happy to help. Is anybody already familiar with the idea of core, core vocabulary? A little bit? Perfect. All right. So um, something that you're going to start seeing a lot, or we haven't seen in recent years, so um, it's very interesting, one of the AAC groups I'm in for speech language pathologists, Someone last week posed the question, where did this concept come from? And it was really interesting to see amongst professionals that people weren't aware of how long this concept has actually existed. Um, it did not originate with our field. It's actually a concept that had pre-existed us in linguistics. Um, in the International Journal, the first time it showed up was in 1989, so still around for a little while. A lot of the core displays you'll see have that familiar color coding. It's modified Fitzgerald key, so you'll see that yellow pronoun, green verb, the first time that showed up, um, a woman published a book on that system in 1926. So none of this information is necessarily new that I'm presenting you, other than a lot of the information, the resources I'll be giving you today. So we talk about, <laughs> when we talk about what core vocabulary, it's just a little loud. Um, when we talk about what core vocabulary is, what we're looking at are the words and messages that are commonly used by a huge variety of individuals. They are high, frequently occurring words. So what I mean by that are these are the words that everyone in the room uses often, right? They're not real specific or unique to a given individual. And when they study that, now depending on the study you look at, I've seen estimates as low as 70 75%, but all the way up to something like 85% of those words that we use on a regular basis when they've done language samples, it actually is comprised of only about 250 to 350 words. So when you think about the inventory that a fluent speaker has, 250 and 350, those are small numbers. It's actually not a huge variety of language that we're talking about here. This is one example of a list that you would see. Um, so this is the Benji list is a commonly cited one. What he did was essentially sit down in a room full of some toddlers, then they took a lot of language samples. And from that, they looked at the words that were used most often, and they examined those, and what they came out with was this list here. So for any of us who have had toddlers or worked with toddlers, it's probably not real surprising that the most frequently used word was I, and the second most frequently used word was no, right? <laughs> exactly. You all know what I'm talking about. This is not a surprise. Um, keep continuing down. Yes, my, especially if they have siblings, may even be higher on the list, right? Um, one of the things that you'll notice as you go down and see the, want, is, um, a lot of verbs, some prepositions in there with I. Um, what we don't see a lot of, Nouns. In actuality, when we look at the core <coughs> vocabulary, the frequently used vocabulary, we actually use not a lot of nouns as a percentage. We're typically using other parts of speech for the majority of our communication. So that is language when they were looking at toddlers. This is an example somebody had looked at 100 most frequently used words for fluent adult SGD or speech generating device users. Uh, so they went through and ranked them. And again, when you look at it, you'll see I, the, to, and, not a ton of nouns. Um, actually, on this particular list, because they are AAC users, the Liberator and the Pathfinder are nouns. Those are actually speech generating devices themselves. So they had a need, though, probably been identifying, this is my Pathfinder, this is what I use to communicate, or something along those lines. The majority of the other words that you're going to see up there, you'll see some adverbs, some pronouns. Um, and just a small sample, so looking at only those words, you can actually cover a few different types of communication, different functions, we would say. So there's questions there, there's comments there, um, things that someone could put together to make a variety of sentences that would mean a variety of needs for different activities and in different spaces. 
if you go to look for core vocabulary, a lot of people have studied this at this point. And we looked at a lot of different situations. So this is from the University of Nebraska, and this is some of the lists that they supplied. There's a lot more. Literally, people have studied the generic texting vocabulary used by college students. I can only imagine what they found. <laughs> um, similarly, young adults, 20 to 30 year olds, I'm not sure I want to read them, but the list exists, right? You can actually go through based on targeted populations, category used during breaks in an employment setting. That is a very narrow scope, right? Not a lot of overlap necessarily. But what we do find is there is more than you would think. A lot, again, pronouns, verbs, other things, less nouns that you would think of. So essentially what the research decided is the majority of our communication is met by these needs. This is the bulk or the corpus of what it is that we're using to communicate with on a frequent basis. So when AAC researchers sat down and started looking at ways to kind of expand the language, they started looking at these lists and these ideas that were already existing in linguistics to say, how can we maximize what we're doing for our AAC users? With the smallest amount of vocabulary or smallest amount of effort, how can we maximize the output that they're going to be able to generate? If 85% of our vocabulary is made up of this set of words, that does not account for 15%. Right? There's a number of words that I'm not talking about so far. And if that core vocabulary is made up of words that are used frequently and by a huge variety of us, what about all those words that are used by individual speakers? Right? What are we talking about with that? So that concept we refer to as fringe vocabulary. So these are all of our words that are really specific to a given individual, a particular topic or environment. And that's going to be a smaller percentage of what we say. It's very often going to be nouns. So this is where our real activity specific language comes in. A lot of what I'm talking about today, obviously, is going to be not super high frequency words. Um, that might fall into that fringe vocabulary idea. For an example, if you were talking about art, you could still use some of those other concepts, right? We're going to talk with prepositions, we're going to use our verbs, you're going to get some of that I want, give me, those types of things. But we're going to start mixing in paintbrush, paint, chalk. These are not words I'm going to then use in the lunchroom necessarily, or use at home when I'm getting ready or playing with my peers. But they're words are, that might be needed or desired while I'm participating in that specific activity. Same with the car. Anybody doing race cars and everything else, we've got go, we've got stop, we're definitely using that core. But other words that our individuals may want to talk about, particularly our kids who are in new cars, they're going to want to talk about the steering wheel. I've had children who know far more parts to, clearly, I don't know that many parts to a car, um, but I've had children who know far more of them than I do, and can get very, very specific. So why are we talking about core vocabulary? Um, anytime we're talking about creating a system for an individual to use to communicate, we want to make sure we're thinking about as many situations for them as possible, or as many reasons they would need to communicate. The one that most of us are really good about thinking about are those wants and needs, which makes sense, particularly for those of us who work with nonverbal children, um, those who may have behaviors. Um, you want to know what it is that they want and what they need as soon as possible to prevent those behaviors from escalating. Uh, if we have a child or an individual with high medical needs, we definitely need to know their wants and needs as soon as possible. But other things we want to make sure that we're thinking about when we look at our vocabulary systems are that getting and giving information. AEC users have a lot of information to share with us. Obviously, we want to exchange with them. We need to make sure that their systems allow for that. Social interaction is a really fundamental, important part of being a human and are interacting with each other. That they're going to be success, and I don't mean successful monetarily, I mean successful in that they're going to be content, that they're going to be able to participate out in the world. That's something that is going to be impressed upon them, they're going to have to be able to participate in. So we need to make sure the language is there in order for them to do that. Refusing and rejecting. Um, personally, I'm feeling like that's one of the first things we need to do, particularly with our individuals with complex communication needs. Uh, these are individuals who are often put in situations where they are told what they'll be doing, they are given tasks or given items, whether they want them or not. So giving them the ability and the autonomy to say no, and I don't like that, is an incredibly powerful thing. Um, it's something that everybody should have access to at all times. Labeling and describing, similarly, we need to know what it is individuals want as soon as possible. There's safety things involved, wanting to know if something <coughs> happened to them, bless you, how it happened, where it happened. So, part and parcel of getting and giving information. 
and then commenting as well. So knowing what it is that someone likes, what they dislike, part of our social interaction. We like to give each other our thoughts and our ideas, so allowing for that in our individual systems. So when thinking about core vocabulary, this is one example of what we typically would call a topic board. Everyone's probably seen something like this. So in a topic board, I picked a particular activity, so in this case we're looking at a Lego activity, and thought ahead and said, here's the language that I think might be useful to my AAC user in order to participate in that activity. So you're gonna see things like Legos, Mini fig. I just learned what that meant recently, didn't know that's what we called that. Um, stack, take apart, brick. Not super high frequency words, but necessary for that task. These are often given to our AAC users, sometimes in a separate page in their device, someone will bring it up. Sometimes an individual board, they're just given a printout, low tech piece of paper with these words on it and presented. The thing we want to think about is in that situation, are they going to be able to accomplish these other things? Some of it, not all. Okay. Um, not a great way to do that with using rejection that I just talked about, for example. We can kind of do the all done, but that's about it. Um, not a lot of information unless it's pertaining to Legos, as an example. Um, that social interaction, if you think about playing a game, even as adults in the community, when we get together with our friends, most of the vocabulary that we're using is not actually about the game, if you think about it. We're talking about other things. You know, if you go to a, a casino, um, people standing around the, table, the card tables are not just talking about the playing cards. They're talking about the casino, the room, the events that they've been to, the things coming up that they want to do. They're talking socially with each other. Um, this board gives you limited opportunity to participate in those types of activities. This is an example of a core board called the Universal Core. So now looking at something like that, it gives you a few more opportunities. Um, so I can talk about what I do or he or she, what they do. Um, I do have some things that are more akin to rejecting or saying no or stop. I can ask questions, I can give a little more information by combining some of these words. Um, a few opportunities for commenting, and that's 36 words. But in com combination and working with them, it gives me the opportunity to expand the types of things that I need to say in a given opportunity. vocabulary is not, it does not mean an absence of French vocabulary. If you leave with nothing else, please do not confuse and think that I'm saying that someone should not have access to those words. Those Lego words can be really, really important. Right? If we have a child who is self-injurious or aggressive, walk up to one of those parents and tell them I'm taking away those words you just spent the last couple of years teaching your child and giving you just a series of pronouns, that's a great way to have them turn around and leave, right? You all know what I'm talking about. We are not going to take away those words. Those words can be incredibly important. When I talk about using those pronouns and then gesturing, combining, that's assuming the individual can do that. If I don't have the physical ability, if my reference is not in the room, having access to that fringe becomes incredibly important. The other thing core vocabulary is not, to be very clear, is the only kind of vocabulary organization that's out there. So what we're talking about today, there are a number of other systems out there Traditional orthography, so just writing and text prediction for individuals who are able to do that, certainly a viable option. Visual scene display, these pictures are hot spots, so I can push on something. It's going to provide more context for my users. This is also a viable option for communication. Um, there's no reason to assume that that couldn't be used for somebody as needed. What we want to do is emphasize the core vocabulary as much as possible while still giving access to that French vocabulary. We want to think about the fact that core vocabulary is going to meet more of their needs, more of the time, in more situations. It's going to be more flexible. That Lego is a great word to have if I want to put the Legos in the other room. Outside of that, it really doesn't do me a lot of good. Not going to help me. So having access to that other vocabulary and knowing how to use it is a very powerful and important thing. However, keeping my net friendship vocabulary is going to make it more complete communication. It's definitely going to make it more personal. It's going to be comprised of, you know, if my kid really likes to go to the lake and talk about their weekends, Disney World, things like that that are really motivating for them to talk about, things that their kids and other peers in school want to talk about, absolutely we're going to make sure that they have a way to use that. So in thinking about core vocabulary and where one can find that, if that's something that you're going to be looking for, your user doesn't already have, 
a big variety of low-tech systems. It does not have to be on a device. A lot of low-tech systems out there either have or you can easily make using the idea of further vocabulary. You can make those into boards pretty quickly, and there's a lot of materials out there that will allow us to do that. And pretty much every major speed generating device that you can find out there has some sort of core vocabulary system in them nowadays. So this is one particular thing you can look for if you don't have access, if you're looking for um, systems. <coughs> Logic Core has been federally funded through a grant. Um, it's available through the team at the University of North Carolina. They came up with the Universal Core. So they looked at those same 36 words I showed you before. And all the information is running through that grant. So everything that they have is free. So you, guys, you guys and the therapist working with it, anybody, you just log on and you can find all this stuff. Uh, so 3D symbols as well. They have three, if you have access to a 3D printer, they have created the 3D symbols that work for these all this vocabulary. Universal boards and the file type to make it a larger poster size. They list it as a classroom because this project is primarily geared towards that. But I will tell you, I've had some families that were really, really successful by making things like that and placing them in their home. So even a child who may have a high-tech device, probably not putting it on the dinner table while we're having soup and pasta, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe having it on the wall behind them, though, so there's still access to that vocabulary. Um, they have made some other things, so high contrast symbols, maybe for vision impairments, as well as different sizes for people and it's a little bit of different access type. All that information is for free. Other low-tech options, so a lot of the vendors that make the high-tech devices have also made low-tech versions available for free on their websites. So some of the names that you know, um, PRC, Saltillo, Toby Dynabox, we're empowered for grid free, which is through Smartbox. They all have low-tech versions available to download and print for free. Um, I do like to point out for those that those are great not only if you don't have a device, but if you do. So again, not just the pasta idea, but we live in Florida, so there's a lot of water around. If we're going to the beach, I do not recommend someone bringing their $15,000 ID system to the place. We will find another way. Um, so even my users from high tech still need that access to core when they're not able, for whatever reason, to use their high tech. Um, in the years I've been doing this, I have seen devices get dropped, thrown, chargers get lost. I had a, a child whose device was lost for, I think it was two years where they found it in the back of a chemistry building in school. They moved it when they were cleaning the classrooms and it wound up in a science lab. Thank God the parents labeled it. Um, a lot of things like that. So backups. Backups are key. How many of us in here have used our original cell phone that we bought? <laughs> Literally never had a person say yes to this question, right? Even if we find the child the best device in the world, it will break, something will happen. So thinking ahead, we need low tech systems. If you're wanting to make your own, again, there's, low, there's all sorts of lists for core vocabulary. If you are not seeing what you like in the systems that are already made, you can make your own. Um, there's a lot of software out there. These are just a small sampling of things that you can use. Board Maker, a lot of people are familiar with those PCS symbols. Um, also, Toby Dynamox uses the same ones. Lesson Picks, I think they're here today. Um, they have a lot of materials and similarity that makes sense. News to you has symbol stacks. Those are the same symbols that you would see on like a Saltillo or a Polo Go. Go. Um, and they also do a free trial period. So you can try out the system first and see how it works and how the symbols operate, and then make whatever that system or a piece that is that you need using their system. These are just some samples from some of those vendors, the high tech systems. Um, Toby Dynamax has some for. Um, this one's from Saltillo, it's word power, <coughs> excuse me. And this is LAMP, available by PRC. So all of them are using those general principles. Um, because there are different lists, as I'm showing you, there's a lot of overlap in the vocabulary, but you will see some differences. All these can be customized as well, but those are the types of things you want to be thinking through when you are making changes. Most likely when they are put in there, those may be chosen by things like frequency or population. Um, so if we're removing it, we just want to make sure we're thinking through, well, where is that word going to be? Is it something that maybe is used more frequently than I think of? I have a question. John, most of the softwares, like what we use is low tech. Mm -hmm. But your core board, your 36 words of core, are they always in the same order on the board? Like, 
my son has a tendency to point in the middle, like at the bottom middle, and we thought it was because he had a word there that he really, really liked. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, used something else. Mm -hmm. So can you move those words around, or are the 36 words really best, you know, in one position? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to give you a multifaceted answer. Okay. I hate when people do that, but I apologize okay. if you're the child in question. <laughs> um, so and the reason I'm going to do that is the answer is it depends on the individual. Okay. Um, some individuals, there are motor reasons why they may tend to go towards the same right. area, and we do find if they move it, they wind up in the same area. So right. then we have to look at augmenting the motor somehow. Okay. Um, that being said, this particular program right here is an example when I say LAMP. It stands for Language Acquisition Through Motor Planning. So this entire system was built upon the idea of motor planning. So how many of us are like touch typers in here? You type on a keyboard without looking. Most of us? Okay. If I were to give you guys an alphanumeric just order, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, what would that do to your rate of typing, do you think? <laughs> yeah. So we have a lot of people and tendencies to um, going to the same location for things. It can really increase our rate of communication. So I always caution people against moving it around. Obviously, there are reasons in assessment and what have you where we would want to to look for those other things. But for some of my individuals, we occasionally get really hung up on, you hear people talk about discrimination, right? There are some people, well, they're not discriminating, so I'm not going to give them more language. The reality is for some people, I don't visually discriminate when I'm typing anymore either. I don't look at the keyboard. I know where they are. My fingers go to the location. I'm typing. It's fluid. Um, it's not necessary for me to look at the keys. So if I have that concrete motor plane, it's really not super relevant whether or not I'm visually discriminating in that moment. And you will see from conventions, there's some phenomenal AAC users where they will actually remove the overlays. And it's just a blank board, but because they've memorized the patterns. Um, Chris Klein does this, if anyone's ever seen the video, he types with his toe. Um, and he doesn't have to look at what he's doing because he's used the same system for I don't know how long. He actually buys up the really old ones in the banking where they call the Pathfinder, and he keeps them in a closet to occasionally put out calls to the ABC community. And he does not change it for that reason. Okay. The spacing and everything else is super critical to his speed of communication. And he'll speak live. He comes to a lot of these conferences and things, and we'll see him, and it's phenomenal. So moving on him would be very detrimental. Okay. So can you answer the question? Yeah, because like we switched it, and so then I am learning along with my son. I'm like, where's I? I'm like. <laughs> I have to go through all the letters trying to figure out where it's at. So I didn't know if that was purposeful that they kept it that way or if it, you know, just depends on the SLP or whatever. Yeah, that's typically the reason is we want to really minimize that. It's also why um, not everybody, but a lot of individuals when doing AEC assessments, um, I might do an assessment on a program like LAMP, and maybe I'm not going to show them all the <coughs> four buttons at once. LAMP only comes in 84, though. So I may hide the rest so that only three are available, but where those three are never changes. Okay. okay. So as I'm acquiring new, and if I only have two other things here, when I add in the fourth, new is still there. It didn't move on me. And exactly what you're saying, you're relearning it, right? So right. every time I start with two buttons, they go, okay, now I'm going to give them four or five. They're relearning something they already know. We're kind of wasting their time. That's right. part okay. of the thought, kind of core as well. Wondering. Yeah. It just, it's relearning something we've already spent time on. Okay. So. Thank you. There are a number of apps as well, so if your user is using a tablet or iPad or you're looking at them, um, that universe of course, so again, the one through Project Core, they have a complete list. But looking at some of the big ones that are out there, Polo Code to Go, um, Speak for Yourself, Snap Plus Core, um, Thirsty, Saltillo, they have some that are low tech boards. Uh, Clicker is another app that's out there. Um, but within them, they all have options for core vocabulary. In thinking about implementation, we'll talk a little bit about modeling. And the reason we talk about modeling, I don't know if anybody's seen this quote before. Um, this woman sat down and figured this out. She's better at math than I am. So for a typically developing child, okay, um, by the time they really get speaking at roughly 18 months of age, they'll have had about 4,380 waking hours of being exposed to natural speech. Right? We're talking to our kids all the time before they're able to communicate verbally. For AAC users, we're using something different, right? they're using this, a low-tech board or a high-tech device. If they're only getting it those two times a week for 20 to 30 minutes, it's going to take them the equivalent of 84 years of exposure to match what that 18-month-old received. 
That's part of when we talk about modeling, and that's what we're thinking about. We want to maximize the amount of input they're getting on their system. It's not about them and their output. It's what we're doing for them and how we're teaching them. Have you all seen this video already? Yeah. I'll show you one more time. <laughs> Watching it this time, I don't know if you already thought, so we tend to look at this little kid because he's amazing and beautiful and why wouldn't you? Um, but watch this dad for me, uh, he's incredible. And a lot of us do this, right? When he's working with, talking with his son, he looks, everything that kid does, he's giving meaning to, right? He's giving them words back. He's giving them gestures, he's giving them context. They have a great exchange. Watch what this father does with his son. Boy is really distracting because he's the cutest thing I've ever seen. But <laughs> what did you notice about what dad was doing? He was responding. Responded to everything, right? That was nonsensical, literal babble, and that dad was all over it, right? What else did we notice? Repeating some of the same hand gestures and everything. It's incredible. <laughs> you really look at it. That kid is doing the hand, he's doing the pointing, and if you look back to dad, they're doing the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. So he's modeling. What, for his son, and that son's taking it in and doing it right back to him. And my guess is that kid's about a year old. I don't know these people from anything. I probably saw the same way you guys did because it was everywhere. But um, that's a phenomenal that Hopefully that dad does it all the time and mom just got the video because they were being super cute in the moment. But that's the kind of thing that we do with our typically developing kids, right? You sit and play with them. They make a buff sound of the ball. We're like, you're a genius. You said ball. That's awesome. It's the ball. Have the ball. Yay, ball. That's what we want to do for our AAC users. When we talk about modeling, the thing we want to think about is we do have to know a little bit about the system, right? A little bit easier on that dad because obviously he's fluent and he's verbal. So for him to kind of chime in there and talk with words and gesture and everything, that's what he's kind of doing. So we need to work on that on our users' devices. We need to be able to do a similar kind of idea. I have their device in front of me. I'm using it to talk to that. Okay. If it helps, because we tend to get overwhelmed. That's a lot to learn in some of these systems. There's something called the plus one rule you may have heard of. And so literally it means if you have a child who's not using their device yet, modeling a single word as you're talking can be enough. But once your kid's doing that single word, we don't want to stay at one word, right? A child cannot, nobody can learn what they don't see. So once they're hitting one word, I should be doing at least two words. They say go, I'm going to say go fast. You're right, let's go fast or go slow and start adding on, two to three, etc. We want to talk about fun stuff, even if it's core vocabulary, even if it's propositions, right? Propositions can be fun. We can talk about building things with the Legos, but talk about putting one over or under or in or on, same with things like Play-Doh. We need to make it fun so that they're going to want to attend to it. That little kid could not break, I mean, he looked at the TV, but then he was all about his dad. I want to hang out with that dad. I mean, he was fun, right? He was animated. He was adorable. So make it a fun activity. Make it conversational. All those different functions we talk about. So I know sometimes looking at 
a row of things like pronouns. It doesn't look super exciting. Um, but we're going to try and work it in while we do different types of communication. When we model, we are teaching the vocabulary and we are teaching where it is in the system, but we're also teaching pragmatics, right? We're teaching them that social communication. We're teaching them how things go together and how it's going to be used. Um, really embarrassing, but I took Spanish for like five, six years. I had no one to use it with. I'm telling you, I got like nothing left. I can understand <laughs> it, not much. When we talk about foreign language models, always they say the most successful ones are those moving towards like an immersion, right? They have to hear it and speak it back. It's really, really, people much smarter than I, I'm sure, can learn from a book, but it's a hard thing to do. So just because we've painted our child in the ABC system does not mean they're going to know how to use it in different situations. It does not mean that they're going to know how to meet their needs with these different functions. We have to be showing it all the time. Don't worry about mistakes. You are going to make mistakes, and that's fine. I honestly think it's a good thing, because our AAC users are going to make mistakes. So the lesson there is, what do you do when you make a mistake? Um, I teach at UCF um, graduate program for speech language pathology. And one of my favorite things I do every semester is when the grad students take AAC for the first time, I set up a lab, and I give them all these systems. I make them use it to communicate. And one of my favorite things with lots of students will soon be working with AACs or say, well, I made a mistake. How do I fix it? That's a great question. What do you do? And they panic. Um, I don't see it right, so I only see when I do the whole message, but they're five words in, and that's very stressful. You're right, it's stressful, so how, what do you do? Us experiencing it can be really helpful, because sometimes that's when we notice, first of all. That was the first time some of them realized that the program they were using only had a clear all set up. It didn't have a way to erase a single word. So they lost all that hard work they did, and they were mad, and they shouldn't have been mad. Um, I've messed with them some semesters and done stuff like giving them a device that scans and not letting it hit the whole bar, so they finish the whole message. And they go the whole time without realizing until the very end. Um, and I like to do it because sometimes, and as therapists, we're all kind of guilty. Sometimes we go in, we're racing between sessions, mm -hmm. and people aren't always thinking about that. And it's not until we sit down and really use it that we start to pick up on these things. So first of all, it's good for us to be seeing. But second of all, when we make those mistakes, that's our chance to show them how we fix it, what that repair strategy looks like. So maybe it's just as simple as erasing and going back. That's not necessarily an intuitive thing. You know, if they're not someone who types or uses a lot of these systems, the concept of delete or clear all and what the difference is, is not real intuitive. Um, maybe they're looking for a word that's not there, or they don't know how to find it. So you modeling search for that word is really valuable. Sometimes talking through, I go to, I bounce between a lot of different systems, so occasionally I forget. It's a great thing to say, oh, you know what, car isn't actually with the toys. Let's go back out to the groups, like the old school think alouds, right? Let's go back, back to our groups. Here's a button for vehicles. I know boats are in there. Let's check and see if our cars are in there. Here they are. They're in here with the boats under vehicles. See how it has this picture, whatever the picture is. And I talk through what it is that I'm doing and how I found it. That's an important skill for them to see what that strategy was and how it was that we figured out how to circumnavigate it. Um, the other thing to think about, particularly in the beginning, um, now, for some AAC users, I will tell you, your child may pass you quite quickly. That's a good thing. It makes us feel kind of dumb sometimes, but it's a great sign. Um, but at least in the beginning, we always want to be using it more than the AAC users. A lot of people who come in and say, well, they're not using the device. And when I talk to them, no one else is either. And just again, remember, they're not going to use what they don't see. So especially when we start, the more we can, we want to be touching the system, using it, different settings, and for different reasons. With different people as much as possible. You never know what it is that's going to make the difference. Um, one of my favorite, and I wish I had a video, but it was actually a grad student of mine, and she was working with a little boy. Mom had purchased this app, and she was second guessing herself, so she brought him into us. She actually did a great job. Um, parents know their kids really well. She picked a good app. And so we sat down with the kid, and he's doing that thing where he comes in and he's just hitting buttons, and she says, He's just hitting buttons. He doesn't know what it's for, he's not talking. And my student sat down with him and starts applying meaning to everything he does. So he winds up on a page with temperature words, and he hits hot, and she starts going, oh my gosh, really animated. And he looks at her, and he hits cold, and she starts going, ugh, cold. And he smiles, and then he goes back to hot again. And she does the same thing. And he starts laughing, and he starts going word by word. She's applying that meaning, and that was the day you could see it. It was her own little, like, miracle worker Helen Keller moment. It was the first time that he started really getting those words and symbols at meaning. 
And afterwards that, through session on, we started seeing it more and more. I'm not saying he went to writing sentences right out the gate, but he started recognizing that pattern. Mom then started carrying over, and we were looking at those types of activities. He had to have it out, but when he ran out and did things, he was playing the light switch was a favorite in that house, that's when she did the on-off, right? That core vocabulary, she started with those prepositions. She did a great job. someone doing some aided language modeling with an actual AAC user. Um, and one of the things she does, you'll see at the beginning, they clearly worked out ahead of time um, that it was okay for her to film, so she recaps with him a little bit. The thing I want you to notice about this one, when you look to her, when she's modeling, she's using the device with her own communication. It's to augment what she's saying. She's not hitting it and saying, now you do it. There's a big difference between prompts and cues and aided language modeling. So watch this one and then think about that dad with the little boy. noticed about what she was doing. My favorite thing she did was when she asked, uh, why are you tired? And he said, tired, or yes. Um, she didn't go back and say, no, I said, why? And make him type out the answer. She said, yes, you're tired. She agreed with him, yes. And then she went on to provide more language. So that's the modeling piece. If we're sitting there telling him, hit this, touch this, Nobody's going to want to do that for very long, not super functional. We're setting it up as an antagonistic activity. Um, so keeping it something that's going to be more, finding that meaning, working with them and modeling it, is going to make it more motivating as well. So even if, even if he's not tired because we're driving the car for some other reason, she gave him an option to make it up even though that's not the real thing. Absolutely. The other thing to think about, so it's, it's we don't always necessarily know the real thing. But one thing that's really helpful for a lot of AEC users is for us to say what we think it is because it helps with that understanding of how their communication relates to us. So if he says, yes, I'm hearing this. This is how I'm interpreting what it is that you're saying. Um, this is, another example would be for when those breakdowns occur when you're using really vague language. Sometimes it's really helpful to say, um, you know, if they're hitting the same toy, we assume it means they want the toy. Maybe it's not that they want the toy. They're trying to tell us the toy is broken. Right? The battery is dead, it's not working. They're going to get upset. So by saying, oh, you want the toy, I can give you the toy, it gives them another opportunity to say no or something else, as long as we've worked on that rejection. Does that make sense? I do want to talk about some different resources for you guys moving forward. Um, some additional ones for implementation. If you've never looked at Practical AAC, they are a great resource. They are both a blog and a Facebook group. Um, they are actually out of Nova, uh, so kind of local to home. Uh, but they have a ton of information about core vocabulary. Um, she's done a lot with a year of core, so literally month by month, and they'll provide smart charts or images of those core words. They'll give you book suggestions for those core words most months. 
and then calendars like this with activities. And everything we make is beautiful. Um, not like the stuff I make, they're much more cuter. <laughs> it's hanging my calendars on the wall. Um, assistive wear, so these are the creators of Prolo Code Go. They also have totally for free something called the Forward Classroom, at least free for now. Um, as a heads up, it does say beta, so theoretically they could change this at any time. I will tell you this has been in beta for three, three years, something like that. They've had it out for a little while now. Um, but some free downloadable boards um, of their, similar to their product, um, some planners, these five minute fillers, and a lot of more activities that you'll have in the home. So sometimes we think of these things as geared towards school, but I've had a lot of parents use these and they love them because as much as I say core that we use it all the time, sometimes it's really hard in the moment to think of a new way to use this and that. Uh, so it's nice to kind of think about, okay, thinking about information or questions and how they can be combined. And they do a nice job of giving you activities specific and how they can be implemented. Project Core, so that's that resource we made that Universal Board I showed you before. Um, really geared towards educators, but if you guys are wanting to learn more about this, they, have, they are set up as professional development modules, but they are free. Um, it's the kind of things that are good to, also because you can recommend them to the people working with your family members. Really free, they can sign up, everything's federally funded, uh, so there's no charge to access any of the information that they've made. <coughs> Saltillo, they do make um, some high-tech devices, but they also have a number of free resources. I really like some of their lesson plans because of that plus one rule that we talked about. Um, so they have you know, the I, and then they show ways to expand it for that function. So the function's down the side, and if I'm gonna comment, let's work on I, and then next we'll work on I like. So if you're really following that, you know, we can only take on one word at a time, nothing wrong with that. But thinking ahead, they've kind of mapped out for you a way to kind of add to that and build that language. If they use some of their programs, they do have some of those smart charts already done for you, but it's easily adapted for any other program. The AAC Language Lab, um, this one's made by PRC, so again, it has a lot of their symbols, but they have another of free activities available, so the lesson plans and activities and resources. Um, if you like those for a fee, they'll open it up to the more complete resources. Um, some of our local centers have access, so like, at the FAST Center, for example, in Orlando, we have an account, so if you come into one of our centers, you can sit down and we'll show you what those products are, you can try them out, take a look, and see what would be useful to you and your family. Reading is a great time to sit down and share your AAC systems with your AAC system. And there are a lot of book lists out there pertaining to core vocabulary. If you go online, um, practice AAC, again, um, amazing kids, and speech to the pirates, um, our blogs that you can find that all have lists. And does anyone know Kate Aper? Um, she has a group online that's, I'm gonna get the name wrong, um, but she's an educator out of Massachusetts. She does a lot with AAC. She has a uh, Google Doc out there that people add to. Um, so they'll break it down by the core word and then recommend books that cover those words. Great time to sit down and do some modeling alongside the book. We touched on this briefly, but there's also a lot of things online to make sure that they have access everywhere. You are not taking your $10,000 device into the pool, and no one wants you to, but there are a lot of systems out there or ways to create them really low cost. A lot of these come from parents. You guys are like serious MacGyvers. I'm always impressed by what I see. I believe this one was. I know this one was. Yeah. These are from Cafe Press. A lot of people who've sent in things and had it manufactured. So if they're doing a cooking activity, they still have their core board on. I've never actually seen anyone functionally use the mug. I just thought that was cute, but you get the idea. They'll put it They'll put it on anything. I've seen it made on pillows or in the house. So if the user is relaxing on the couch, their core board is right nearby. Any, oh, I'm standing on myself. Um, another resource so I mentioned, the FAFS Center. Again, I am an employee, uh, but we are available with all of the different, most of the systems I talked about today, the high-tech systems, as well as that low-tech software, we will have in our different centers. So if you're wanting to sit down with someone and compare them side to side, we are set up to do demonstrations with you and to look at some of those options. Um, we do a lot of information and referring, so we can give you more information about other resources that might be helpful to you. Find you local referral sites, so if you feel like you need a professional to conduct the evaluation, you're not comfortable making your own core board or creating your system, they'll know professionals in your area that might be able to assist you with that. 
Uh, we're set up to do more trainings and things like this so we can sit down with you and they can be one-on-one. -on -one. Um, all our services are covered through a grant. We don't bill insurance. The great thing about that is that also means for parents, you do not have to have your child with you, right? You're going to a therapist because they're billing. They have to have the individual there for treatment. We don't, and I know a lot of parents who want to not bring their child when they come to learn about these things. That's totally okay. Um, you can also send us the, the uh, therapist or anybody working with your child, educators, and we'll sit down with them as well and show them any of these systems and talk them through ways that they can support your family member. We'll sit down and do the demos with you and or your user. And then at the end, for most of the equipment we have, we can lend it. That means we can lend it to you to try in the home with your family member. We can also lend it, though, to any of those professionals working with them. So if you are wanting to conduct a comprehensive eval with one of your own therapists, but they don't have access to the type of equipment we're talking about today, they can borrow it from us, conduct that eval, help inform you guys, again, still no charge to them. So a good resource for you guys to be aware of. We do a number of special programs with CSIDA events and things like that, um, presenting or exhibiting. We do have recycling centers, so funding becomes a problem or is an option. We have some facilities where they'll take old systems that people aren't using anymore, refurbish them, and then they'll be available to you. Similarly, I'd like to tell people about our AT list. It's kind of like Craigslist, but for assistive technology. So we can post, but other people, individuals can as well, and you'll see a full range of AT. Sometimes you'll see AC systems, but you'll also find ADL kind of stuff in the home. Um, I think the last time I went on there, there was several different bedpan commode situations. You'll see wheelchairs, all sorts of stuff. So good resource to be aware of. We also do have the loan program, so if you are looking for one of those systems and you find out your insurance is not available, there is a program that you can look at that will help you find financing or do a low interest loan in order to help acquire those systems that you might need. And that also will, will do if you have a co -pay. Yes. Yeah. This is Michael, he's the executive director of the FAST program here for the state of Florida. <laughs> he will be available afterwards if you have some additional questions. And these are our regional centers. Um, so we are located throughout the state. I'm here from our Orlando office over by UCF, but we have offices in Tampa all the way down to Miami and back up over in Panhandle. So um, definitely reach out to us. We work a bit almost like an interlibrary loan, so if your local center doesn't have something, we do reach out to each other. We also have a statewide library, so if you're needing something for a longer period of time, we're able to help set that up for you as well. talking about fun and having fun with our AEC users. None of you all have seen this one either. Um, but these ladies were on their way to the conference and they were participating in, has anyone seen that carpool karaoke on late night? Um, so they did some forward karaoke uh, with their forward on the way to their conference. That was pretty cute. Cover a range of genres and time periods. <laughs> um, but just be thinking about it again, we want to have fun with the modeling that we do. Um, I wanted to allow some time for questions about resources or core vocabulary or different systems, assessment, anything you guys have. Yes? So I have a kid that verbal for once and needs a friend about vocabulary, but getting him to use preposition, pronoun, do that. I just call the legal word, but I don't know how to He'll believe all kinds of words. How can we, because he can speak, but he won't speak for those things. Mm -hmm. like, I want to go to the store, 
because it's not something. We want to put those other words in there. So how would you kind of limit this kind of situation for the missing words? Mm -hmm. So we want to take a look at his system and what he has going already and how we can incorporate it. If there's a way to do it without causing too much disruption, we will. But sometimes if it's really just a whole lot of nouns, there's not a great way. Sometimes we're looking at bringing in some of those other organizations and setups. Um, the other thing I'd be looking at is if he's able to remove them, we want to make sure we get that thing locked down as best we can. Um, and there are a lot of different tricks and systems and cases and all sorts of things to look at. No, I mean, he'll delete them. So instead of right. saying, I want to go to the store, it might be sore candy. So, oh, so I'm putting those words in. Mm -hmm. put them back in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of different ways we can add them in, and certainly if it's something you have it with you today. I don't have advice. Okay. And he's, he's, he doesn't like when you show this, it's like all done. So that's the kind of situation I'm with with that too. And what I do love about that is it's very communicative. Mm -hmm. um, so again, so I'm looking at different ways we can incorporate it, and sometimes it's finding the right activity or the different way to place it. So I have some kids who, sometimes I have had them where they are not loving to use their certain system board, but when you bring in a different board, all of a sudden they're using it. So it's looking at sometimes the diversity and trying those different resources that are available. And we're really finding a way to get that in play. Um, the other thing we'll be looking at are kind of how it's being used across environments. So talking with some school age, uh, school. Home school. Okay. So looking at how it's being used throughout the day and those different types of functions and activities, so that we're generalizing beyond just those couple of things. Yeah, the other thing we did it with someone who had like seven words, but I don't know how they use it, and so maybe that's why he doesn't want to do it. Possibly. So that might be one thing where we're coming in and getting some little bit of training and support on ways to implement it. We'd be happy to help. And honestly, a lot of those resources are really great. A lot of therapists use them. And they're going to give some of those ideas as well, the activities and ways to incorporate that vocabulary. Cool. Good. Absolutely. I have a two-year-old with Down syndrome. And I expect that eventually he will be verbal, but right now communication is very difficult for us. Do you think even some of the low-tech options would benefit Absolutely. I like to throw out, we have a substantial body of research at this point, and literally there's nothing to point to a loss of speech or preventing the speech. For a significant percentage of children, it will actually help them learn to speak. They're getting that visual, and if it's high tech, that auditory feedback. And all of a sudden, we're able to reinforce their attempts for a behavior where we're just guessing. Um, I will tell you there's a certain percentage of people where no change occurs, but if you think about the people we're serving, it makes a lot of sense. We deal with people with structural issues, anatomical things are missing, no matter what system I give them, they're not going to be able to produce certain sounds. Um, I have started AEC systems for on children younger than two, use a diagnosis, um, and they, it's a great time to do it, just like you see with foreign language and everything else. They pick it up fast. A lot of those kids are just waiting to find a way to communicate. Um, so absolutely, if they're able to, you know, a low-tech core can look great. It's an easy thing to start with, at least. You can start experimenting. It will not hurt to start experimenting, even in the home. Those printable options are great. And it helps to start looking at, so if you do decide to move to something high tech, you'll already have some information. I've looked at this number. I could do four things, but I could not do 12. Or you know what she did great with four to do? I don't know. Um, how she handles the low tech. I will tell you that some kids don't do as well with low tech as they do with high. It just depends on the individual user. But that's all good information to have. Yeah, my son didn't do well with the core board, but he has the um, AAC device now that he has Snap Core on. And I will tell you, his language did improve tremendously by using this. So I I was worried that it would get him to stop trying to talk because I was giving him the ability to talk, but it didn't at all. Like now he's trying to say those words or trying to mutter those words because of that communication is getting out there now. And he knows how to use it 10 times more than I do. So he can flip through it and fly through it and show me how to do things so he's able to say it. And how you can be avoided with the device? Um, I actually, my insurance declined it, and I, I wish I would have known about these, you know, things before, because I actually had to purchase it myself, and I bought it through Toby Dynavox, um, but as she said, you can just go online, and there's some device transitional things to where you can get it for a little bit cheaper. I know there are like... Like a diagnosis paper to get the device, well, or you, recommendation for You'll get the your therapy. pediatrician to do a referral. And then uh -huh. they will send you to a speech a speech evaluation, and then their speech evaluation person will send you to say yes, you need to get an AMC device, and then you'll go and get an Atlas. Because in my experience, probably mine, I could try it with, you know, with pictures. She yeah, refused, he can't, to, she he refused to use that, but she loved it. Yes. 
And but I never come to you because I'm afraid she's because she can communicate that so work but right. And we try to right. make a sense. You know, it's more yeah, and you can, you can actually download some of the screen ones on your cell phone to see if she, she does that and it goes on there. But I mean, he can do that quickly. I can tell you that he does really talk a lot more and even try to. I mean, his new word is why, which we all love that word. But I can tell you that it definitely did help tremendously. And he still does his sign language stuff too, so he does have ways to communicate and with whomever he needs to. Okay. So, a couple things just to add. So. Look in here, and whatever your insurance provider is, most likely they will require speech generating device valve. Some, particularly private insurances, do not cover speech generating devices. So it's a good thing to find out before launching into that process. Okay, and okay. um, the first step for the device mm -hmm. is going to the pediatrician, right? Uh, that depends on your funding source. Yeah, your yeah. funding source. You have to CMS or oh, yes. well care or whatever. Mm -hmm. We just had somebody out there, and what I suggested from them is call on, on the card, there's on the back there's that toll-free number, call and tell them the group number and ask them if communication devices are covered. And if they say, if they ask for a code, it'll be like an E, you know, 2510, it'll, it'll be in the 2500, so 25, E2510. And then ask them to send you information about the procedures that you need to go through to get it. Because and is it a specific device? Any of no. those. Well, depending again on what they cover, some have more restrictions. Because than also, I have, um, she's home at school, mm -hmm. and also we have the, the step up. Mm -hmm. They can help cover some kind of that dispense, you know, it's like. And it's, it's yeah. honestly, funding is a very personal choice, but I will tell you the nice thing about insurance is once it's been documented that it's a medical need and they've provided that initial funding, if something happens to that device, they then do the repairs. Because okay. it's been documented it's a medical need, right? Okay. So once that warranty is up, you get your SLP or whomever to write a short repair note saying, yes, it's still medically necessary, you're paying for your device repair, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just kidding. She's going to be kidding with me. She's going to be the community yeah. at the store. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking when she's growing up, and you know, I'm getting old, and she didn't go to the store to communicate and leads, and the people can understand what she needs, what she wants. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other great thing that, I'm sorry, putting it <laughs> Leslie said, um, is that her son is still using different ways to communicate, right? He's yeah. still signing, he's still so he using like any kind of A really important like thing, which I didn't say explicitly, but even once we introduce that, we are going to 110% reinforce all of those other things. An AAC system is not a device. It should not be a device, rather. A device is one part of that system. It should be verbal, it should be sign whatever they have. I have texted today, I have emailed, I have talked to my phone, right? I've used a lot of different ways to communicate with someone today. We want the same for our children. And if your children's child rather says something that's intelligible, we are not going to say go get a message again. Right? We're going to say, absolutely, you're right. You said you wanted a hamburger, we are getting a hamburger. You know I want a hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>